Okay, everyone can hear me, great. So what it says on the slide here, we're, we're achieving significant reductions in the burden of atherosclerotic plaque and we intend to continue the way we started. So skipping over the boring stuff. The current standard of care, the big problem here, the thing I'm gonna beat you over the head with for five minutes, is that it cannot greatly, rapidly, or reliably reduce the existing burden of plaque, but we can, and that is our value proposition. So this is gonna kill you, probably, if nobody does something about it. The rupture of the plaque that grows in blood vessels kills 27% of us directly, and that's in a world in which everybody who uses statins can use, you everybody can use statins, will use statins. And that doesn't account for the people who are killed less directly by the reduced blood flow to the heart leading to heart failure. It's not a good thing, and it's, it's the greatest single cause of, of human mortality, greater even than, than cancer. So if you look at it, the plaque is the problem. If the more plaque you have, with this great data from a Dutch study, the greater your mortality risk. If you have five or six plaques that somebody can go in and look at the scan and say, oh, look, plaques, then your, your risk of mortality is sort of five times higher than somebody who doesn't have those plaques. And you'll, you'll notice that's a very large range, by the way. The type of plaque matters greatly. How much fat is in it? How much cholesterol is stuck in that plaque? How likely is it to rupture? But either way, if your cardiologist can see five plaques in your major arteries, you're not in a good place. You want to do something about it. But today, what can you do about it? Not an awful lot. Um, I, I pulled out these two, um, these two meta-analysis studies as good examples of, you know, there's any number of others we can go look at. And they looked at several dozen studies and thousands of patients. And, you know, look at the numbers on the right. But percent, um, percent atheroma volume is the percentage of your, the volume of your artery that's obstructed by plaque. And you're looking for percentage change in that, in that number. You want, it to go, you want it to go lower. But if people are doing these things for 18 months, you know, minus 5% to plus 3%, that's not a great form of treatment. And the standard mean difference is even worse. It's basically zero. Um, if you go take statins for 18 months, your, your existing plaque is still gonna be there at the end of the day. But the plaque is the story. It's the most important part of this because there are very large studies that show that if you can produce a 1% reduction in your percent atheroma volume, just, just 1%, the, the increase in your, your ability to have blood flow and the, the, the reduction in your cardiovascular events is huge. It's just like 20%. So that takes 18 months probably, thereabouts, and only a subset of patients can actually achieve that, no matter how low they reduce their blood cholesterol to. You have people taking combinations of the modern PCSK9 inhibitors and statins, and they have like a blood cholesterol level of 20, you know, and they have existing plaque, and it's going to stay there. And why am, I, why am I pointing out this 1%? That leads up to the next slide, which is kind of the point, which is what we can do in mice, which is reduce the relative cross-sectional area in the aorta of the plaque by 17% in six weeks of treatment. Now, I, I hate to be primary school on you, but we look at a cross-sectional area and, uh, at random in the plaque to get that 17%, and then you assume that it's gonna hold the whole thing through, so it's, it's volume, or not just cross-sectional area is being reduced by that 17%. And this is, this is a big deal, this is really important, because we can reliably do this in mice. Um, and we hope to be able to do the same in humans. So how do we do this in mice? Uh, and the short answer is, well, we use a lipid nanoparticle mRNA gene therapy to go in there and make cells clear out localized deposits of excess free cholesterol. And I'm sure you, you understand all the words in isolation, but the context would probably help a little more. So look, excess free cholesterol is a feature of aging. Unfortunately, it's also a feature of obesity, which is why a lot of obesity looks an awful lot like aging in ways. You, uh, cholesterol is transported around the, the body a lot. It isn't really made or destroyed locally. Um, and that, you have a complex transport system. With aging, that transport system breaks down in ways that give you localized excesses of cholesterol. And that localized excess means that it overwhelms the cell's ability to make free cholesterol safe by esterifying it or shoving it into cell membranes or attaching it to transport particles. And that free cholesterol is toxic, very toxic. Um, and in the liver 
particularly because the liver is the center of cholesterol metabolism, your liver function is greatly diminished and harmed by this, this excess free cholesterol. Now, unfortunately, this is undruggable. There's no breakdown cholesterol mechanism in the human body that you can adjust with a small molecule. You can't bind enough cholesterol with something like a cyclodextrin to get rid of these excesses without killing the patient first by sucking cholesterol out of cell membranes. And in particular, LDL cholesterol in the bloodstream, which is the target of lipid-lowering therapies, has very tenuous relationship at best with the excess of cholesterol in, that might occur at some place in your body. You can lower it as low, as low as you like, and it won't really do much to that localized excess of cholesterol. So, that said, there are human proteins that can act in conjunction to degrade cholesterol, uh, excess-free cholesterol. They just aren't expressed in near all cells in our body. So we took the best of these, we turned them into an optimized fusion protein, we encode that fusion protein in messenger RNA, we stick the messenger RNA into a lipid nanoparticle that's targeted to the liver, we inject it via IV, it goes to the liver, it expresses our fusion protein in liver cells, and that clears out the excess free cholesterol in the liver, and thereby the liver is restored to homeostasis, and you get systemic benefits throughout the body by removing this, this age-related, obesity-related contribution to disease and dysfunction, not just atherosclerosis, many other things too. So we are heading in the direction of our, our first human trials, and our focus is on the rare genetic disease of homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia that I will only say HOFH from now on for the obvious reason. Um, these patients have massively huge, enormous blood cholesterol levels. Um, and over a lifetime, that means that uh, they get very accelerated atherosclerosis and absent any sort of intervention, these people die in their 30s. Um, they're not, not in a good shape. There aren't that many of them, and that means the FDA gives you a much easier time of it, and we're looking at fast, potentially fast-track approval. So this is kind of what our timeline looks like. Um, and I, I'm putting the non-human primate studies here in parallel because I'm going to make a point about those in a moment. Late, in, late next year, we're going to know efficacy data in a large non-human primate for our therapy. Um, but that goes in parallel with getting ready for uh, clinical trials in early 2026. And of course, questions of time are questions of money. All this depends on raising a Series A this year and uh, getting into bed with, this, with the CDMOs and our partners and all the rest of it. Everything's lined up. It just needs the fundraising to complete, and off we go. Um, and this, of course, is, is, wow, 18 months is a long time, you might think, but this is, this is very fast in the world of biotech, as I'm sure many of you are aware. So this is why I wanted to mention the non-human primate studies. It's sort of an interesting aside. There's a company called Verve Therapeutics who you might, recent, you might have heard recently running into trouble, but back in 2019, they were riding high because they had just gone public at a $1 billion valuation, and the only data they had was in non-human primates. They hadn't done any human trials at that point, and their therapy is, is objectively worse than ours, much worse than ours. It's just a, 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 better, it's a better statin. Honestly, it lowers, it lowers LDL cholesterol. It cannot possibly reverse plaque, just like all of the other um, LDL lowering technologies. So we will be in this position about 15 months from now with a much, much better therapy, food for thought, for those who are thinking about investing in us. And I should say, you know, atherosclerosis is what we came in to do, this company to do, um, but it's not where we'll stop, it's not where this will stop. This is a first-in-class therapy that's gonna spawn half an industry that's gonna be out there tackling many, many conditions that are aggravated by free cholesterol pathology. This should be a hallmark of aging. It isn't, because they haven't got there yet, but I'm sure as the hallmarks expand, somebody will. We have demonstrated that we can reverse metabolic dysfunction associated with steta hepatitis. We can reverse the fibrosis associated with that disease. Um, uh, we've also demonstrated in the course of that that this is relevant to type 2 diabetes because we greatly improve, improve glucose tolerance and insulin levels by clearing excess free cholesterol from the liver. There are numerous neurodegenerative conditions um, in which the, the, the lipid metabolism of the brain is clearly aberrant. You see cells with lipid droplets in the brain. There's clearly something going wrong in there with, um, and we believe that excess cholesterol is probably relevant. 
And there's a whole bunch of things I can point to in the cancer field, in immunology, in uh, a number of other rare diseases in which cholesterol processing goes wrong in some part of the body, where a therapy like ours could come in and treat these things. This is obviously an industry that will come after us, not us. Atherosclerosis is a very big problem in and of itself, but there's a big, there's a big pipeline here. So in the remaining 10 minutes here, I'm going to take you through a very brief tour of uh, our results in atherosclerotic mice. Uh, and this is the high level only. We have, we have reams of data, volumes of data, but um, the most important stuff is, of course, what happens, what happens to the plaque. So this is a really great picture, and I'm hoping this actually shows up properly on the bigger screen, and I, I think it does. So the interesting thing about the, these, these LDLR knockout mice that are the model for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, the humans also have loss of function in, in LDLR, so the liver can't take up cholesterol, so the blood is filled with just gunk. Um, lots of cholesterol, lots of triglycerides. Um, and it's actually the serum, when you take it out of these mice, it's actually, um, it's actually opaque. It has so much, so much stuff in there. So this is a time series where we took some mice, we injected them once, and then we sacrificed them at, um, at various points along the way. And you can see that by 96 hours, a single injection of our, of our therapy has essentially reversed the problem in the serum. Serum is back to being clear. We've removed the gunk. And uh, that has a very, very impressive effect on the plaque, as I, as I said. And so this is, the, this is the same thing I showed you earlier, the 17%. Uh, just to fill in the facts here, we took LDLR knockout mice. We did the normal high-fat diet to make them severely atherosclerotic for over 16 weeks. And we gave them six weeks of weekly injections with our lipid nanoparticle. And we used a very broad range of doses. And those who know the lipid nanoparticle space, you know, you, you don't go far wrong by picking something between 0.5 mg per kg and 1 mg per kg. And, and that seems everything works out to that dose in the end um, for some reason. So we, we picked a range of doses, and they all worked. Um, and you average across the groups, and you get this 17% reduction in cross-sectional area. Um, and there's nothing stopping us, by the way, coming back and then waiting a few weeks and doing another six weeks with these mice. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but in principle, you should get more regression of plaque. So we then took these mice and we stuck them on a treadmill. Now, these are not mice that are going to win any prizes for exercise anywhere because they're fat, they're sedentary. Um, but the, all of the treated mice, at whatever dose we treated with them, and I want you to note, this is an enormously broad therapeutic window, um, no side effects whatsoever, and benefits at all doses. And all of the treated mice regained cardiovascular function to a very sizable degree versus the mice who were still impeded by the severe atherosclerosis that they were suffering. Um, if we move over to the APOE null mice, which are the model, the more accepted model for, for atherosclerosis in the general population, though both models are relevant to atherosclerosis in the general population, we did a study where we compared with a statin. Um, we did the same, put them on a high-fat diet, give them six weeks of treatment. Um, in this case, it's a single dose, one mg per kg, and a reasonable dose of a torvastatin that's going to give you no liver, liver problems, but an effect size. You can see that we're much better than statins, and we synergize with statins. Um, so it's important that all other treatments are complementary to ours, be that cyclarities or statins or PCSK9 inhibitors. They can all be used in this vast space. It's an enormous industry. There's room for everybody. So, and again, this treatment could be repeated in principle. You can keep going. You could take a break and do it again for six weeks later, and we would expect larger results to result from that. Now, the important thing is we're not just sucking lipids out of the plaques and thereby stabilizing them. We're also putting in um, collagen. The, the lipids are effectively being replaced by collagen. You get a more fibrotic plaque, which is stable, safer, and it's not, it's not calcified. I'm not going to present data, but I will say that in these models, you get a reversal of, um, of calcification in these plaques as well, though you should take that with the grain of salt that the LDLR models and the APOE models are not specifically models of calcification. You treat 100 mice, you're going to get 10 maybe or 20 that have, that have a large degree of calcification in their plaques. So I won't rep to that. So 
I'll final, uh, final finish up by mentioning our team. I think most of you know me and, and Bill, the co-founders here. We, we come from sort of an investment patient advocacy background. Um, Morad is a tremendously talented researcher who is here today, so you should take the, take the chance to talk to him. He has a, a very good background in cardiometabolic disease and, um, and is probably the world's leading expert at this point on clearing cholesterol for therapeutic effect. Uh, Bobby Kahn is a very reputable, very well-known cardiovascular physician um, who has put drugs through the FDA and gives us good advice on our forthcoming, forthcoming clinical program. And I really should mention um, that none of this would be possible without our very talented lab team who are here standing outside the, the one of the two restaurants in Syracuse, New York that you have to go to if you go to Syracuse, New York. So now you know. If you're there, go to this restaurant. So, and collectively, this is now the World Brain Trust on, um, on clearing cholesterol for therapeutic effect, as the, this program is only being conducted by us. Nobody else has this, nobody else owns this, nobody else is working on this. We are the, the first in class approach to reversing cardiovascular disease. Now, as I noted earlier, you know, we welcome inquiries from interested investors. We are raising, we do have a safe note out in advance of our A round, and we are looking for an A round lead. Um, so if you want to be that A round lead and you happen to be in the room, come talk to us at the next break. And thank you. <laughs>